All right. Thank you, everyone. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So thanks especially to Simone and Alex, and of course to all of you uh, for inviting me here to speak with you today about some of the research that my group is doing at UC Davis. Um, and this isn't actually a fake background. It is, let's see. Great, there's the Discord invite. Um, it's, I'm actually in my lab right now. I thought it might be kind of fun um, at the end if anybody wants a tour or if you have any questions about some of the equipment, um, no pressure, but you know, I'd be happy to show you around the lab a little bit. Um, but basically what I'm gonna talk to you about today is viruses in soil and other environments. So my lab mostly studies uh, viruses in soil through DNA sequencing based approaches. Um, and so of course, Nobody could be more familiar with viruses than all of us over the last year and a half, right? Um, so I'm here to tell you about some viruses that are not so bad. All right, I'm gonna hide something here. Here we go. So um, I, I thought it might be nice to give you just a teeny bit of background about me um, before I go into the research. And of course, I'll give you some, some background on the topic before we go straight into uh, some of the, the results from our ongoing studies. Um, but since some of you, you know, obviously you're interested in STEM, you're out here on a Saturday night, hanging out and listening to a talk. Um, so maybe some of you are also interested in careers in STEM. So I wanted to give you just a, a little bit of an idea of, you know, what I did kind of between high school and, and where I am today. Um, so I did take AP biology in high school. Certainly there are plenty of biology professors who did not do that. So that's not a requirement, but for those of you who are doing that, um, you know, I had some awesome high school biology teachers, which is really what got me into biology in the first place. Um, I went to a college, uh, the College of William and Mary on the East Coast, where there was only one flavor of biology major. Um, so I majored in biology, I got a bachelor's in biology, but at a lot of universities, so for example, at UC Davis, there are tons of different kinds of biology majors, you can specialize in subfields. Um, so that's an option potentially, I did a few summer research internships as an under graduate student in college. Um, and then I worked in a research lab uh, doing microbial genomics for about four years between undergraduate and graduate school. And then um, I got a PhD at UC Berkeley. I was studying this beautiful hypersaline lake in Australia. So it's pink because it's at saturation with respect to salt and the microbes that live there make a pigment um, to cope with that environment. So it's literally the microorganisms in there that are making the lake pink. And so this isn't snow, this is all salt. I also studied a CO2 driven geyser in graduate school. So this is an image of that geyser. And I'm, I'm sure you're at least vaguely familiar with geysers at Yellowstone, for example, whether you've seen them or not, um, they're driven by steam. So they're very, very hot, right? Um, this is actually the same idea, but it's an underground carbon dioxide gas source that drives this geyser. So it's cold, it's actually colder than at the surface um, uh, where you would collect a sample here. So we studied the, the microbes that lived in that geyser to get a feel for um, what bugs were living in the, the subsurface. And then I moved on to a postdoc, which is, a, you know, almost like an apprenticeship that you do in a slightly different field right after you get your PhD. Um, so I went to the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I was studying microbes in air. Um, so in both indoor and outdoor air, and this was one of our field sites. This is a tower. It's this like crazy rickety elevator that you could ride up. So basically, we're looking out the window of the elevator that you can stick your head out of. Um, and my car is like somewhere down here on the ground. So we would collect the microorganisms up in the top of this tower. Um, we would also collect microbes on these uh, sterile Petri plates in people's homes. So we would hang them from the ceiling. And actually there isn't any growth media in here, which is what you would typically see in a Petri plate. This is just an empty plastic dish that collects falling dust particles. So then I did another postdoc, so another one of these kind of post-PhD apprenticeships. Um, this one was split between two labs, one in Tucson, Arizona, and one in Columbus, Ohio, but it was the same project in both labs. Um, and I was studying this beautiful thawing permafrost ecosystem in Northern Sweden. Um, it's this like hydrologically interconnected lake and peatland ecosystem. So peat being that sort of really um, organic carbon rich um, um, like moss derived uh, soil. And so I was studying the microbes and the viruses in that system. So that gives you kind of a feel for all of the things that I did before starting at UC Davis. Um, so I started here in 2017 and I'm, I'm a professor here, which means that I teach, uh, but I also run a research lab 
which is what you can see behind me and what we're going to focus on for most of the rest of this talk. All right, so just a very dry, quick overview of what we're going to discuss today. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to viruses in general. I know that on some level they require no introduction these days, but, but just to get everybody on the same page. Um, and also viral ecology, which is maybe something that you might not think about as much as you think of like individual viral species that can cause disease. Viral ecology is this idea that viruses exist in microbial communities, just like other microorganisms. So there's a lot of complexity there um, of, you know, sort of virus interactions with their hosts and with the environment. And so that's kind of what we'll, we'll discuss is like, what's a virus? What role do viruses play in microbial ecosystems? And then what are the methods that we use in a research lab to study viral ecology? And then that'll be the background. That's probably at least half of the talk is going to be really getting us up to speed. And then um, the last half or maybe a third of the talk will be some specific research examples from uh, the work that we're doing in our lab right now. So viral communities in tomato fields at UC Davis, there's a lot of agricultural based research. Um, so we'll discuss some of that. And then different soil habitats in California. Some of these are going to be quite familiar to you. Um, so what do viruses look like? How do they compare across different kinds of habitats? And then um, dry versus wet grasslands. It turns out that there's some really interesting patterns in viral community composition in dry versus really wet soil. All right, so let's get started here. First of all, viruses are tiny. You kind of know that, but I like to put this in, um, in perspective by showing you this really awesome SEM image um, of bacteria on a needle tip. So here is the tip of a needle. Those are a whole bunch of bacteria on it. Now, if we look at viruses, these are viruses that infect the bacteria. So they're teeny tiny. Here we've zoomed in on one bacterial cell and all of those little artificially colored blue guys are, are viruses. And I also like to show this teeny image at the bottom, which is basically putting this bigger image to the same scale as this one here. So that gives you, you know, you can't even really see those little blue dots. That gives you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. So as you may know, um, viruses can have DNA genomes, just like we do. They can also have RNA genomes. And those genomes are encased inside a protein coat. So here's um, a protein coat of a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. Here would be um, a protein coat of either the influenza virus or SARS-CoV-2, which is the causative agent of COVID-19. Um, so some of these viruses also, like influenza and SARS-CoV-2, can have this host-derived lipid uh, membrane envelope on the outside. So basically, they kind of bleb off the host cell as they're, um, you know, um, leaving, and they take a piece of that host cell membrane with them um, to encase that protein capsid. So basically the point of showing all of this is that you know viruses are basically made of the same biological molecules as cells. They're just packaged a little bit differently. So you may be a little bit more familiar with cell biology, um, but you know it's the same genome, proteins, sometimes lipids, they all exist in viruses. And what that means conveniently for research purposes is that the same say DNA or RNA extraction approaches that you would apply uniformly across all kinds of biological samples, they also work for viruses just as easily. So there's no added complexity to get that um, genome out of a virus uh, relative to how you would do that for um, a host cell. But something else that makes viruses a little bit different is that they have tiny genomes, tiny and relatively simple genomes. So um, to kind of give you a ballpark feel, I mean, there's you know a wide range of genome sizes of viruses and all kinds of other organisms. So just like vaguely, viruses are going to have on the order of five to 100 genes. Some have less, some have more, but the vast majority of viruses are in that ballpark. Uh, but most bacteria have thousands of genes and most eukaryotes like us have tens of thousands of genes. And so that you know gives you a feel for the complexity of what these organisms are able to do because of course their genes are encoding the functions that they can potentially carry out, right? All right, so because viruses just don't have a lot of um, genomic material to encode you know, things that they might be able to do, they rely on um, energy sources and replication machinery from their hosts, right? So this is a host cell machinery, ha ha ha, that the viruses take over. See, look, it's cell machinery, oh my goodness, hilarious. Okay, it's the funniest thing you guys have heard all night, right? 
All right, so viruses also come in many shapes, right? So uh, I, I think this is, you know, it, th there aren't that many shapes in this picture and viruses don't come in like thousands of different shapes. You know, they probably come in like 30 different shapes. But again, that, you know, drives home a little bit of this point of, you know, viruses also exist in complex ecosystems. They're not all one type. So this gives you um, a sense of scale, 100 nanometers, that doesn't mean anything to you. It's very, very, very small as we saw on that earlier image. So some of these viruses are like lemon or football shaped. Some of them have this classic head and tail morphology. Some of them are just like straight lines. They're called helical viruses because their genomes are kind of wound up um, all in here, ju -ju 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 -ju, and so on and so forth. So uh, the point here is that viruses exist in communities, complex communities, just like other microorganisms. So as you may know, viruses infect all three domains of life. You've probably learned in your biology classes about the three domains of life. We don't wanna leave archaea in the dust here. Those are really important um, in some environments. In fact, that hypersaline lake that I showed you uh, that I worked on for my dissertation at UC Berkeley, completely dominated by archaea, like 95% of the organisms in that lake are archaea. But okay, so viruses infect all of these. But the vast majority of molecular studies of viruses um, have been of, okay, weird, sorry. Let me just exit something here. Something popped up on my computer. So most um, molecular virology studies are focused on eukaryotic viruses. And I'm gonna pose this question as though you're an audience that's answering, but you can answer in your own head and give yourself a pat on the back for getting it correct. Um, why do you think viruses, that in fact eukaryotes are the ones that are most commonly studied in excruciating detail um, molecularly. The answer, as you surmised, is that that's what we care about. They make us sick, they make the food that we eat sick, right? They can um, infect plants and so on and so forth. And so understanding what they're doing is pretty important to humans. On the other hand, archaea and bacteria, these little unicellular organisms, uh, many studies of viruses in the environment are gonna focus on viruses that infect these two domains of life. And so again, I pose this rhetorical question of, you know, sort of why do you think that is? Um, and that the simple answer, as you might guess, is that most of the organisms that you're finding in the environment are bacteria and archaea, right? If I go out to, um, you know, scoop up a little bit of soil that I'm gonna go study in the lab and I put it in a tube about this big, I'm not gonna put a bear in there. Like that's just gonna have a whole bunch of microbes, right? So maybe there might be some slightly bigger microbes, maybe some microbial eukaryotes, but the vast majority of what I'm gonna find out in the ocean, say, or in a lake or in soil, um, those are mostly going to be bacteria and archaea. So the viruses then are mostly going to be infecting them. So just to drive the point home of, you know, why we would care about viruses that infect bacteria, the main answer is that there are lots of bacteria around and they're doing all kinds of important things. And I'm not gonna talk in great detail um, about how awesome and important bacteria are. I'll give you like a couple of little hints later, but the point is they're everywhere. They're doing a lot of things. They're really abundant in soil, on and in humans, um, even in the currency that we pass around, even in the air um, and so on. But it turns out that viruses that infect these bacteria, on average, are about 10 times more abundant even than the bacteria themselves. Um, and, you know, in some environments, we know a little bit more about these viruses than others. But generally speaking, we know much less about these really abundant viruses um, than we know about the bacterial hosts. So that kind of leaves it, you know, wide open as an area uh, to study. So just to give you a feel for how much we're missing in terms of viral diversity right now, like what we know about viruses. This is a phylogenetic tree. So um, just, you know, sort of bifurcating dendrogram of relationships among bacterial phyla. So each of these branches along the tree is a different bacterial phylum. You know phylum, right? Kingdom phylum class, order, family, genus, species. Um, so really high level groups of bacteria here. And then each of these individual teeny tiny squares is uh, represents a single virus that's known to infect a bacterium within that whole phylum. So you can imagine that the sheer number of bacteria that are represented in this phylum here, I mean, it's tens of thousands, right? So um, one of these boxes means that there is a known virus that infects at least one bacterium 
within this, um, this whole phylum of bacteria. And you can see that there's a huge stack of a whole bunch of different viruses that are infecting this particular phylum, this particular phylum, and this one, but none that are infecting this one or this one or this one and so on. And so you might think to yourself, you probably wouldn't, you're all on a Saturday night checking out a STEM talk, um, but you might think, okay, that means that there are just way more viruses that infect this group. Um, no, actually, we're just really biased with what we're looking at, right? So um, why do you think there are so many known viruses for some of these groups, but not others? The answer is that there's just so much bias towards viruses of either human pathogens or of bacterial lab rats. So basically, if we're, you know, if we have kind of a model bacterial organism in the lab, E. coli, or a human pathogen, E. coli, we know a lot about the viruses that infect that group of microbes. And these actually, almost all of these viruses are E. coli bacteriophages. So there's a whole lot of viral biodiversity waiting to be discovered. That doesn't mean that, you know, this phylum has no viruses. This phylum probably has tens of thousands of viruses. We just have never seen them before because we haven't looked very hard. So again, bringing it home, I study viruses in the environment. And uh, so I wanna discuss kind of why that's important. So viruses, of course, they, in, uh, they impact bacterial host mortality. So they kill their hosts. I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. Um, I'm not gonna discuss very much about viral impacts on host evolution, although I'd be happy to answer some questions about that later. Um, I'm also gonna focus on viral impacts on environmental chemistry. So how do viruses impact carbon and nutrient cycling in the environment? Okay, so here's the soil that I might wanna study. These are the viruses. This is obviously not to scale, um, but we wanna figure out who these guys are and what their impacts are in the environment. So just to give you um, a feel for this, first we wanna discuss viral replication strategies. And you may have learned some of this um, in a class previously. If you haven't, that's totally fine. We'll go over it. Um, but viruses generally replicate according to two different um, strategies, at least viruses that infect bacteria. One of these is called the lytic cycle. That's what we're looking at here. So we have um, a virus or a, a bacteriophage here. This red little bit is meant to represent the viral genome. So let's say the viral DNA or RNA. Um, so the virus is gonna inject its, its genetic material into the host. Here's the host cell chromosome. So that's the host's genome. And then there's um, immediate replication of the virus in this, in this particular replication cycle. So here it's like chopping up the host um, DNA and RNA and it's making copies of itself. It's basically taking over the host cell machinery to make lots of little individual viral particles and it's ultimately bursting open that host cell to release those viruses. And so this is what that looks like under the microscope. I love this image. Um, so this is uh, an E. coli cell here outlined in this kind of light whitish color and it's being burst by all of these individual viral particles in these sort of little lighter but um, smaller, almost like round blobs or oblong blobs. Uh, those are all viruses that are being released after undergoing the lytic cycle in an E. coli cell. Um, and I like this because it shows not only host mortality, right? Obviously this uh, bacterium is very, very dead at this point, um, but it also shows you know, how many viruses are potentially released from this process and the change in chemistry that's involved. So um, whereas previously, all of this um, material that was part of the bacterium, what we call bacterial biomass. Um, so all of the, you know, DNA and RNA and proteins and, you know, the cell wall and, and all of that business, that was all contained nicely within one cell. It wasn't available very easily for other organisms to eat unless they're big organisms that can eat it whole. But now that you burst all of this material out into the environment, all of this stuff that was stuck inside the cell is is now suddenly available for other microorganisms to eat. So this is, can kind of feed a community in a way, or at least really change the chemistry. You can imagine that if one tiny E. coli cell is doing this in the environment, that might not make a difference that you could measure. But what's happening is that these individual viruses might now go and infect other cells. And you had this change reaction where if you have all of the cells of one kind of population bursting open, that can actually potentially have a real measurable impact on the chemistry of your system. Right, so that's one of our replication strategies. And here we're going to look at um, 
what it looks like in the lab. So we just saw under the microscope what you know um, viruses killing bacteria looks like in the lab. This is um, a test tube that would be like in a little tube rack that you might shake overnight with some really um, you know delicious bacterial tofu, whatever they want to eat um, in here. And so you're going to get bacterial growth that looks cloudy. You can imagine if you leave the dishes in your sink for too long, it's the same idea. You get microbes growing and you can visibly see them. But if you take the same culture and you add bacteriophages or viruses that infect that bacteria, they're going to kill them, burst them open, and sort of, you know, they're going to change the optical properties and chemistry um, of that culture because they're bursting open those cells and, you know, making what was, you know, sort of a bigger clump of organic matter of, you know, carbon and nitrogen and all that good stuff into smaller, um, smaller little bits. And so to show you that also on, um, on like a petri plate, what we have here, um, this is it's almost in reverse. What you might be used to with a Petri dish if you're growing um, organisms on it is you have individual organisms growing in little circles. But here, um, what they've done is all of this sort of background whitish stuff, that's all bacteria. They've basically like deliberately put so much bacteria on this plate that it completely covered it in what's called a lawn. And then if you add um, a small amount of phages or you know these viruses that infect bacteria to this plate, you can see what are called plaques. These are these clearings where they've killed um, the host. So here are a few plaques that you can see on this plate again and against a lot of bacteria. Um, if you have a phage that has a successful infection, let's say in here, that infection is going to propagate outward to kill all of the microbial cells. And so if this plate goes back into the incubator, um, the microbes that are right in this halo around here, those guys are next. They should look out. They're, they're about to be killed. So um, obviously phages can cause mortality. And I think that's, um, so, so, you know, the mortality induced by viruses is a, is a bit of a, a heavy topic on the human side for us today. Um, there are certainly exceptions, including SARS-CoV-2, but in the majority of cases, um, viral infection doesn't necessarily lead to death in the human population because we have a lot of cells. So, you know, if you kill and burst open one human cell, there are a lot of cells to kind of make up for that. Whereas um, in, you know, a bacterium that's a single celled organism, if it gets infected and it bursts, that's the end of that one cell's life, right? Okay. So moving along to this other replication strategy that's uh, also common in viruses that infect bacteria, but that maybe you hear about less often, this is called the lysogenic cycle, and it starts the same way as the lytic cycle, where the virus is injecting its nucleic acid or its DNA or RNA into the host cell. And again, here's that host cell chromosome, so the host genome. And what happens here is that the viral genome basically hitches a ride within the host genome. So the viral DNA is inserted into the host DNA, and it essentially replicates passively um, through host cell division. So when the host cell replicates itself, because that viral genome is contained within the host cell genome, the virus gets replicated as well. So this is kind of, you can imagine a nice way for the virus to have kind of a safe haven inside a host cell because the virus is you know, at the mercy of the environment um, when it's just out as a free viral particle. Okay, but let's say um, it's not such a safe environment for the virus the virus wants to leave. We'll cover that in a second, but this is the part where the virus just kind of is dividing. We're calling that the virus like just chilling. If you do like a Google image search, or at least when I did this like a few months ago, um, this is the first image that comes up for just chilling. And I feel like that's like your search is done. Like you don't need to scroll through a whole bunch of images. Like definitely like, a, you know, this like stormtrooper in a, in a suit is what you should go for. Anyway, so um, we have our just chilling stormtrooper virus in a suit until there's some kind of trigger to induce this um, integrated virus to then undergo the lytic cycle. So these viruses that are capable of undergoing the lysogenic cycle can do both. They can either be integrated into the host or they can um, undergo the lytic cycle and burst that host. And so this, um, we've seen this before, if we're a stormtrooper and now the stormtrooper is actually properly attacking and we get that host cell bursting or host cell lysis. All right. So I also mentioned that there are some important potential impacts of viruses uh, on maybe carbon and nutrient cycling. And so I wanted to um, remind you of, or tell you if you don't know already, um, what this 
carbon cycle looks like and what role microbes like bacteria have in the carbon cycle so that then you can imagine, well, if the virus is infecting the bacteria, of course, the virus is having an impact on the microbes that are playing a role in this cycle. So for example, um, we're all, we all know to be worried about um, CO2 and methane emissions, right? So greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but if we're following the CO2 from the atmosphere here, it can potentially be taken up through photosynthesis into plants. So plants are gonna use that CO2 to build more plant. Eventually um, that plant is either going to die and you know its debris are going to go into the soil or it's going to release what are called root exudates. So little um, carbon chemicals from its roots into the environment. So ultimately that CO2 from the atmosphere is gonna end up in the soil as complex carbon. Complex carbon just meaning, you know, big carbon molecules like sugars and, and, and larger. Um, but that, that soil carbon, that's kind of this complex carbon is going to be decomposed by microorganisms, meaning the microbes in the soil can break it back down ultimately into CO2 that then gets released back into the atmosphere. So that's sort of the microbial component of the terrestrial or the, the sort of soil or land, um, land and air carbon cycle. So here's um, where the microbes would be on that side. And it's a very similar idea in the oceans, but of course we don't have complex land plants that are taking in carbon dioxide in the oceans. You know, there are plants here and there, but um, far, and, far and away, it's actually the microorganisms in the oceans. So unicellular bacteria called cyanobacteria in the surface of the oceans that are going to be um, our primary producers taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or the equivalent bicarbonate that's dissolved in the ocean water, building it into their own biomass. And then it's the same microorganisms, or sorry, different microorganisms, but the same idea. So bacteria that are also going to be able to um, decompose, break down that complex carbon uh, back into CO2. And so the whole point here is that viruses also play very important roles on both sides of this equation. And I wanted to show you um, an example from marine systems of where viruses fit in. This is something that's been reasonably well established at this point. We do not have any idea how this works in soil, uh, but basically we have our, our primary producers, our phytoplankton or cyanobacteria. We're gonna follow the carbon in this food web. Um, so these grazers are gonna chomp and, and munch on the phytoplankton. Then these carnivores, this is a really terrifying looking carnivore um, is potentially going to to chomp on the grazers. And so the carbon is going to go up the food chain, essentially. I'm not including um, what we call heterotrophic bacteria. So I'll add those in. Those are those bacteria that can take um, this more complex organic matter or complex carbon um, and, and break it down to build their own biomass. So basically they're able to access this part of the carbon pool that's potentially, you know, a little bit smaller. Um, it's, you know, waste from the grazers, so, so poop, right, and, you know, smaller poop, maybe, um, from, from these kinds of organisms that the heterotrophs can eat. So heterotrophs meaning they can um, use complex carbon just like we can. You know, we eat a tofu burger, we eat a burger, we eat a salad. That's all complex carbon that we can use. It's the same metabolism for these bacteria as we have. All right, so the viruses in this schematic, I'm not going to show you um, the viruses of the eukaryotes. A whole other story, but those that infect the microbes, we can imagine if they're bursting open these microorganisms, what they're doing is keeping that carbon in what's called the microbial loop. So they're keeping the carbon in the microbial portion of the food web because this is not available. The carnivore can't eat this teeny tiny organic matter and actually get energy from it. Um, only the microbes can. So the viruses are essentially keeping that carbon and, and those nutrients in the microbial portion of the food web. This is known as the viral shunt. And viruses kill about 30% of ocean microbial cells this way every single day. So this is not just like a random process that's happening sometimes. This has a huge impact on the carbon cycle in the oceans. And the question is, what about viruses in soil? We know almost nothing about viruses in soil. And so this leads me to my favorite part of my job. Um, we get to learn what nobody else anywhere in the world knows yet. And I wanted to give you a, a, this example of, of, you know, kind of what I mean by this. And I don't know how much you're exposed um, to this, you know, exciting discovery in say your science labs in high school. Um, but what I'm showing here is, here's a woman walking through the forest. She's looking around at, you know, maybe these ferns and, and these tall trees and the plants down here. 
and she's wondering to herself, I wonder what these plants are, like what species of fern is this, right? Um, so she doesn't know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you what species of fern that is, maybe some, some of you know, or maybe you don't, but I would assume that most of us off the tops of our heads can't say exactly what species of fern this is. But the point is somebody on earth knows that. There are people who study these ecosystems. Somebody has, you know, many people have published papers on exactly what this fern is. If you get the right expert, they can tell you this. The really cool thing about soil viruses is that they are not known. We, we know almost nothing about soil viruses and it's not just us, it's the entire world. And so what I'm gonna share with you today, um, if, it, if it seems really basic and like, oh my goodness, like that's all you know, it's because it's literally all the entire world knows about soil viruses to this point. Okay, so here's just thinking about what a new virus in soil can do. We've seen, here's our new viral particle. We've seen what this looks like under the microscope. It can infect a new host. It can then release new viral particles and the host cellular contents, right? So change um, the carbon and nutrients. Then potentially that infection can spread. This is you know, meant to be a schematic cartoon of what's happening in a real microbial community in soil. This is not on a Petri plate. So each of these little colored microbes is a different species, let's say. And that um, virus is very specific to this one yellow species. So it can infect all of the different yellow species, kill all of those yellow bacteria, <clears throat> excuse me, leaving all of the rest of these guys behind, which opens what we call a new niche. So there's now um, you know, a new place and new resources that are now available for let's say this green microbe to propagate. And so your whole microbial community can change as a result of this one viral particle and its infection um, you know, kind of you know, chain reaction through the environment. This is a schematic though. We don't have evidence of this happening in soil yet because nobody has looked. The viral particle can also degrade. If it doesn't encounter a host fast enough, then it is subject to environmental degradation just like anything else in the environment. It can also move around in say hydrolog hydrological conduits like maybe pore water or if you're in an agricultural system through irrigation if you're adding water or after rain, maybe it can move around. Um, it can also get stuck to mineral surfaces and soil particles. So this is hypothetically what can happen to a virus in soil. We have no idea when and how often and what types of viruses are subject to any of these. What we do know just based on microscopy is that there are lots of viruses in every gram of soil. Um, and I showed you that, that statistic just a little bit earlier. And so I wanna tell you like what my lab is interested in. Finally, now that we're like two thirds of the way through the talk, very simply, we wanna know what viruses are where, when, why, and what are their ecological impacts? So what are they doing in the environment? All right, so a brief history of lab techniques. I'm gonna go through this part pretty quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions about it later. Um, so most microbes don't grow easily in the lab. So cultivation-based or growth-based approaches are really not good for microbial communities in general. And because the viruses rely on the hosts, they're certainly not good for the viruses. There isn't a universal marker gene for viruses. If that doesn't mean anything to you, really, really don't worry. But sometimes, um, you know, if there is a universal gene, like for example, bacteria have some genes that every bacterium has, um, you can go out into the environment and amplify that one gene to understand the community. You can't do that for viruses. You can purify viruses uh, from the environment through size selection, right? We've seen that viruses are teeny tiny. Um, so this is pretty straightforward for samples from marine ecosystems or other waters uh, because you can just filter the viruses out. And I'll show you that in a second. So this is a brief sidebar of how viral purification works in aqueous systems like water. Um, so this is from my dissertation work. Remember that really pink hypersaline lake. You collect the water into this little container here. Um, and then you're just gonna filter it. And this is, I'll show you in the next slide, it's gonna be easier to see, but we're basically taking that water through different size filters here, doot, 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 so that we can um, get the smaller viral particles out. And so now kind of bird's eye view of those little filters that we saw before, they're housed in these little, we call them lunar landers, um, but those filters, they look like this when you take them out and you kind of cut them to put them into your tubes. Um, again, they're pink because of the color, the pigment of the microorganisms that live there. But basically what we're doing is we're taking the water, we're filtering it through a whole bunch of different size fractions. And then um, the smallest size, whatever actually comes through that filter, 
is going to be uh, your viral size fraction. So that's typically post 0.2 microns. That's very, very small. Most bacteria are not gonna pass through that filter. And then you can extract viral DNA from what comes through the filter. All right, so that's what we can do in water. But like, how do you do this in soil? You can't like filter soil through a tiny filter. It's just not gonna work, right? But what we actually do, it is possible, I'll show you, is we just add a buffer. That's what the vast majority of this lab is, is based around um, extracting viruses from soil this way. So you have this soil and buffer slurry. You can uh, then put that slurry in a centrifuge to spin down the soil particles. And you can put that through 0.2 micron filters to get the viruses that come out. And then you can extract and sequence that viral DNA. So this is a brand new approach. It seems obvious, it seems easy if we've been doing it in marine systems for so long, but for a variety of reasons, it's been difficult to do in soil. Um, we've really only be, been able to do this reproducibly in a whole bunch of different soils for the last two to three years. So we know almost nothing about viruses in soil or viral communities in soil, but now we have the techniques that we can use to learn. Okay. so. In the last part of the talk, I'm gonna quickly show you some of the research that we're doing. So one uh, project was in agricultural tomato fields. Very basic question, what viruses are there, when and why? We haven't answered even all of those questions, but with one study, I'll show you. So here we are collecting um, soils from a tomato field in Davis. And this is our experimental design, a very simple project for kind of the first project that we did in our lab. We have eight plots within these tomato fields. Don't worry about the colors. Um, and then we sampled them twice. We sampled these plots once um, when it was just soil and we didn't have any tomatoes planted yet and once at tomato harvest. And there were a few things that happened in between as you can imagine in order to facilitate the growth of the tomatoes. So we have kind of before and after samples. Based on these viral um, DNA extractions that we could do from the soil, we found nearly 3,000 viral species. Only 4% of those were identifiable. That means that nearly all of the viruses that we recovered haven't been seen before. Um, and, and you know that's not a surprise to us. The diversity of 2,000 or 3,000 viral species, that's pretty high. Okay, so there's a lot coming out of just this initial exploratory study of how many different viruses are even there. But how do these viral communities um, you know, what, what are some of the things that structure them? So you might imagine, um, is there like a before and after signal in these communities? Um, the answer is yes. So this is called a principal coordinates analysis. And I, I don't want to like overlay belabor how this graph works. So don't get bogged down too much in the details. I'm happy to talk about it more later uh, because these axes are like, honestly, <laughs> they're confusing and difficult to explain. But, but the take home here is that each one of these points is a sample and the proximity of points in this um, two dimensional or um, um, plot space is how similar the viral communities were between any two samples. And so as of right now, you don't have to worry about the labels, but the colors. So we have our samples that were collected pre-planting. So in this like, you know, plain soil essentially, um, or after planting. And this one particular axis shows the vast majority of how viral communities are separating. And so you can see very clearly that the viral communities were really different before planting and after, um, and essentially at tomato harvest, which suggests that there's some underlying driver of a shift in viral community composition. Um, and so that correlates with microbial community composition as well, and it potentially represents some evidence for recruitment of specific viral communities to tomato root zones, right? When tomatoes are there, um, the viral communities are different, and there's evidence for that in microbial communities as well. So that's kind of consistent with what we've seen. Something that we weren't expecting that we thought was pretty cool with these data, though, is if in a second, instead of looking in this dimension, which is most of the change in viral community composition, we're then gonna look in this dimension, which is the sort of secondarily most explanatory separation of viral community composition. It turns out that in this, along this axis here, the individual plots that we sampled stay in the same place. 
what that essentially means is that there's a spatial structuring to viral community composition, that even though the viral communities changed in response to planting, there was some signal that was the same from within the same plot. So something that was either still repeatedly happening over time or that was stable over time. It turns out that this um, also represents an east to west gradient in the field itself. So it's not just each plot was the same. It's that there is um, a similarity in community composition where these two that are more close to each other are more closely related, these two sets of viral communities, and they're the most distant from these two that are farther apart all the way on the other side of the field. So we couldn't explain this spatial pattern with hosts. So the bacterial communities did not exhibit the same pattern um, and the soil properties like the chemistry didn't exhibit the same pattern either. And so we're going to continue to sample to figure out what's going on. But our current hypothesis is that this has something um, to do with dispersal. So how the viruses are moving around and that maybe viruses are more readily dispersed or more differentially dispersed from their hosts. And so one thing we noticed was that there's actually a dirt road that, you know, the tractors and the cars are driving all up and down on this side of the field, but not on any of the other sides of the field. So we're kind of hypothesizing maybe that the viruses are getting kicked up by this dust and you get more of them that are from the road up here, a little bit less, a little bit less. We don't know for sure, but that's kind of a nice guess. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the summary here, but I wanted to show you how fun it is to be collecting samples from these agricultural fields because you know it's blood, sweat, and tears during the day, but at when you come back, um, you can make a nice pasta out of the tomatoes that you collect. So definitely uh, worth considering agriculture if that's something you're interested in. But I wanted to quickly now go over to some of our data from natural systems. And so um, I'll, I'll go through this kind of quickly. And if there's interest at the end, I'm happy to, to go back to it. But I want to make sure you all have time for questions. Um, so this is just a comparison of viral communities across different soil habitats. And I won't um, belabor the experimental design too much, but this is in uh, Northern California near us. And we collected from different habitats, like these grasslands, lots of grass, right? Chaparrales are these shrublands woodlands you can imagine what those are they're like forests but not with as dense a canopy so you know trees but you can get some sky in there um, and then different kinds of wetlands as well so what we found um, from soils that were actually collected during the dry season we didn't really know that as part of our experimental design at the time that's going to become important in a minute but on average if we look at viral species on the y-axis here compared across these four different habitats, with each of these points being an individual sample. And then these box plots are just helping to, you know, guide your eye to, to the averages and, and things like that. You can see that clearly um, there's a statistically significant difference in the number of viral species recovered from wetlands. And this is consistent with something that we're kind of seeing across our soils, which is when soils are dry, we get way fewer viruses. When they're wet, we get way more. Um, we also wanted to compare like how viral communities um, are, you know, similar or different within and across all of these habitats. It turns out that the vast majority of the viruses that we looked at in the study were only found in a single sample. So nearly 3000 of these species were found only in a single sample, which makes it really hard to compare across samples. So we're in the process of kind of redesigning this study to collect different um, you know, over different spatial distances and different um, times in order to potentially start to get to see the same virus over and over again to have a better feel for how these habitats are similar and different. All right, this last part I think is actually pretty easy to understand. So I'm gonna be able to get through it relatively quickly. Um, what we're looking at is the number of viral species. Now this is a lab experiment. We've taken dry soil into the lab and we've added sterile water. You can see with dry soil, really not very many viral species in these grasslands. As soon as we add water, there's evidence for viral production. So the diversity of viral species just goes up astronomically. So this water is kind of waking up the bacteria, or sorry, the, the viruses actually by way of the bacteria as well. It turns out that this is a really reproducible effect across all of our habitats. Now, instead of looking at viral diversity, because we don't have sequences from these yet, 
we're just looking at total DNA yields. Um, this little line represents below detection limits. And these are the number of days um, after wet up. So zero means dry soil. You can see that in all of these habitats after wet up, we're increasing the DNA yield from those viral particles, meaning we think that's like pretty clear evidence for viral production, meaning new viral particles are being made um, after rain. So does this happen in the field as well? So that was in the laboratory. We had a very controlled experiment. We took soil, we added sterile water in the lab. What happens when it just rains out in nature? So here we went to um, a grassland field site near UC Davis. You can see it in November, which is really bone dry. Um, and in February, when we started to get the first rains, you can see that the grass is growing, is getting nice and, and green. I'm sure you're familiar with this in the LA area too. And yes, it's a, it's a beautiful pattern. We're really excited to get the sequencing data um, from these, but you can see when it's really dry down here, our DNA yields from viruses are about zero. Then we call this kind of the false start for the year where there was a little bit of rain here and a response in the viral communities, but then it stayed dry again last year for a long time. So we kind of you know, lost those viral particles over time. And then we had our real rain right in here. This is, this is precipitation. And then this is kind of a schematic of what um, the field was looking like. You can see that that viromic DNA yield representative of the number of viral particles is really increasing throughout that rainy season and throughout the plant growing season. And then as it starts to dry, we see virion decay. Um, this is a really exciting pattern for us. And we're looking forward to digging into the DNA sequencing data to see, you know, are these different viral populations or different viral species that are coming in over time? Are they infecting different hosts over time? Um, and so on and so forth. As of now, we just have the DNA yields that still show a pretty clear signal. So one thing I didn't tell you about our laboratory wet up experiments is that two of them actually started with burned soil. This is something that unfortunately all of us are very familiar with um, in California. So these two laboratory uh, wet up soils, they started dry, but they had already been burned in the LNU complex fires. And they're still showing the same thing in the laboratory. After you add that sterile water, the viral DNA yield is increasing, right? So here's um, sadly what that fire looked like. Again, familiar to all of you, I'm sure, in your local area. But we went to this site um, before the burn in November of 2019. This is the same vantage point in October of 2020 after the LNU complex fires that burned um, about a, a month prior to this. You can see to, to guide your eye, this is the same feature as this right here. So really just um, totally got rid of all of that chaparral shrubland. Here now we're zooming in on this chaparral landscape. This is what it looks like before burn and after burn. And then this is a woodland where we've got, you know, a, a tree over here. All right, so we all know what fire looks like. But again, if you take, um, you know, these burned soils that are bone dry, you add water in the lab, um, you get viral activity. We kind of wanted to know, um, is that what it looks like in the environment as well, right? If you actually get rain, what happens? And so it's the same, it's the same story. Um, that we're seeing here. So here's our burned chaparral habitat, our burned woodland habitat, and our viral DNA yields here on the y-axis. Not showing individual samples, but these box plots kind of highlight the, the median here. Um, before rain, just no yields. We could not get any viral particle DNA out. And then after rain, we see an increase um, in, in viral particle production, right, in, in as using DNA yields as a proxy. And so the summary of this kind of last part of the talk is that soil moisture content really seems to drive um, virion or viral particle production and decay in many of these California soils, not just grasslands, not just sort of quote unquote normal soils, but also burned soils. And so we're really tracking down this story um, in our ongoing research. And so our future directions are, you know, sort of where do these new viruses come from? I think that they are in that safe haven within their host cells. Remember the lysogenic cycle where the viruses can stick their genome inside the host genome? I think that's where most of them are gonna be. We don't know yet, we're gonna find out. Um, we also wanna know, okay, these viruses are produced, maybe they're dynamic. What impacts do they have on their hosts and the environment? And then finally, we're getting more drought over time. We're getting more wildfire. How are these um, you know, climate change impacts going to change virus host dynamics in these ecosystems, and then ultimately, um, you know, the chemistry and potentially the carbon cycling in these environments.
And so I want to thank you all for your attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Okay, that is the end of the lecture. If anybody has any additional questions, please send them to me, but I just have a couple of selected, so I'll just uh, spin them over Great. to you. All right, here's the first one. Is the variance in the amount of viral communities across different habitats exclusively caused by differing precipitation levels, or do you think there are other factors that influence this? Excellent question. Yeah, so, so um, the, you know, sort of, to punt on that, the answer is we don't know. Um, so I can totally speculate. I think that clearly um, the one driver that we've explored the most so far is soil moisture content. And that is very clearly having an impact across the board, but certainly there's going to be um, plant community composition is going to be a driver. So what kinds of plants are there? And then what kinds of root exudates are they providing to the environment? What about the host bacterial communities, right? Like obviously if you're a virus, you can't exist if you don't have a host to help you replicate. So it's kind of, there are lots of chicken and egg problems that we're trying to tease apart because certainly even the rain and the moisture, what, what that's really doing is that that's driving, and this has been established for a long time, that's driving microbial activity. So that's waking up the bacteria that maybe were in, in a spore form or were dormant throughout that dry summer. Um, and what we're seeing is that concomitant with that waking up of the bacteria is a waking up of the viruses. And all we have is abundance right now. We'll see with the sequencing data, whether there's interesting dynamics of those sort of viruses and hosts throughout, um, throughout time. But certainly, you know, the chemistry and the environment, the plants and the bacteria, and probably many other properties in addition to soil moisture content. But that's a great question. Okay, the next question asks, in addition to the number of viral communities in different habitats, do you also compare the types of viral communities and whether some habitats share the same viruses? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, I went through, I had like one tiny slide on that and I like basically didn't cover it. I just like rushed through it. <laughs> um, so, so that is exactly what our goal is. Like what I've kind of shown you today is the preliminary data before we get our sequencing back. Um, and once we get our sequences back, that's really the bread and butter of the lab is where we're going into those DNA sequences to identify specific viruses because, I mean, it's just like you could identify SARS-CoV-2 from COVID, right? Like we know exactly the DNA sequence of certain viruses. So we can go out to the soil, get like 3000 different viruses and have their you know, DNA sequence so that we can then track them across samples. So we can, if we have their DNA sequence, we can track it over time. We can track it across habitats. Um, and again, like just to use the SARS-CoV-2 analogy, that's, you know, we're already doing that, right? So you're all already familiar with people are looking in wastewater for SARS-CoV-2. People are looking in different countries at, you know, how the, um, you know, the different variants are, are moving around. We can do exactly the same thing with these thousands of viral particles. And so I can say that um, we have some data on that from a few different ecosystems. Um, we definitely have that cross habitat comparison, but the caveat is that that was from dry soil. We didn't know any better at the time, but we collected our samples in November, 2019, which is basically the end of that dry cycle. So it's when things are just about the driest they could be. And we learned in our subsequent studies that those viral communities aren't active in dry soil. So what we saw when we compared um, the whole communities of all of the different viral species in those dry soils is that one, there weren't that many viruses, like we just didn't get that high of diversity because probably they weren't active. But two, every single sample was different. Even a sample from the same exact habitat at the same field site, like 50 feet apart, looked completely different. Um, so we don't know yet whether that's because we just sampled at the wrong time, should we have sampled wet soil and we would have seen a better signal? Um, or is that actually true, that these communities are so complex and dynamic and different that even if we had sampled wet soil, they would look different? So yeah, that's a good question. And it's definitely something that we are following up on for sure. Well, you mentioned so many different types of viruses. The next question is asking, well, how are you able to distinguish all these different species? What sort of tools do you use? Yeah. Oh, you're, you're all great. You're asking the same questions that like my professor colleagues would ask. This is great. Um, yeah, so, so there are sort of two sides to that. There's the like, can we identify a virus that's been seen before, right? How do you like taxonomically classify a virus? And we have all kinds of tools that we use to do that. But kind of the take home from that is that almost everything that we see is new. It hasn't been seen before. Um, and so we can't like, you know, 
classify it into the equivalent of SARS-CoV-2 because it hasn't been seen. It's like if you had a new SARS-CoV-2, like but a thousand new SARS-CoV-2s in every single soil sample, how, how would you handle that? And so um, what, what we do is we take those individual sequences and those then essentially represent a viral species. And we do some bioinformatics to cluster. We do have like some very specific thresholds um, that we use that based on, you know, isolate genomes of viruses, you know, seem to kind of represent approximately the species level or something that would make sense. And so literally what we're doing is we're taking all the individual sequences that we get from these viruses and grouping them together based on their sequence similarity. So we don't actually have to have any idea what virus this is. We can just group it based on its sequence. And then like the question, the follow-up question from that is always like, well, how do you even know it's a virus? If it's like so novel and it doesn't match anything. Um, the thing is at the whole genome scale, it doesn't match anything. But if you look at those individual predicted genes, which you can, you know, you can predict genes on the computer based on, um, you know, standard things like start and stop codons that you've probably heard of. Um, so you can bioinformatically predict genes. And then if you have the gene, you can predict the protein, right? You know, how codons convert to amino acids. And so you can get those protein sequences and compare those to public databases. And even though your whole genome doesn't match and most of your genes and proteins don't match, a few will. So there are some, you know, at the protein level, conserved regions of viruses, like the viral capsid protein. It's different across lots of different viral groups, but it's also pretty highly conserved at a really high level. Um, you know, there are lots of versions of it, but you can recognize it. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do. Like we take the sequence, we cluster it at what looks like the species level, and we can be confident that it's a virus as opposed to a bacterium or like, you know, part of a bird feather, um, just based on some of those um, conserved proteins that we identify. Okay, we have one more research-based question, and this yeah. is just a very general one. How many viruses do you estimate exist, including all the other phylums that oh, are typically God. not researched? <laughs> I have never been asked that question before. That's an outstanding question. Um, I mean, I'd have to do like a back of the envelope calculation. I'd say if you're going to count at the species level, also we have to take a snapshot in time because they evolve really quickly. So if you want to include all of the viruses past, present, and future, like, ugh. <laughs> but I'd say it's probably, let's say it's like, it's like, I don't know, a hundred different kinds of viruses per bacterial species. I think that's reasonable. Like it's probably even more than that. It's probably like a thousand viruses per bacterial species. And then you multiply that by the number of species per phylum, which is like, I don't even know, a hundred or a thousand. And then the number of different phyla. I mean, we're talking like millions, billions, trillions. I would bet, yeah. So just before we close this lecture out, I just have two general questions that like somebody might have in the audience. So first yeah. of all, for somebody who's interested in this field as a high schooler, what would you suggest that they like do to eventually like do science, do research in this field? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think I, I'm not sure about research opportunities for high schoolers. There definitely are some. So I would say if you have a local um, research university, so there are like different kinds of colleges, right? There are colleges that are more undergrad focused. Um, there are colleges that also have big research programs. So the UCs, if you have a UC near you, um, you know, definitely kind of scanning department websites in areas that might be of interest to you. And you could cold email a professor, be like, hey, I'm a high school student. I'd be really interested in learning more about your work and possibly doing research in your lab. So that would be like short term, like you want to do this right now. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about college, for instance, I'd say um, getting research experience in college would be really important. It doesn't even have to be, let's say you wanted to study soil viruses, which like almost nobody does. It's like such a small portion of, of the world. But even if that's what you wanna do, you don't have to study soil viruses um, in college, but it would be great to get some lab research experience. I think there's also a tendency when you're just starting college as a freshman or even a sophomore, you're like trying to navigate. I mean, you can remember what it was like to be a freshman or sophomore in high school. Maybe some of you even are freshmen and sophomores in high school. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot to think about, but I think that's actually the best time to get into a research lab um, because those of us who, who run research labs, it takes a lot of time and resources to, to train a new undergraduate student who hasn't been in a lab before. Um, and that's fine, we expect that. 
Um, but it's even better if we can train you as a freshman or sophomore, and then we reap the rewards of your experience when you're a junior or a senior. So I'd say don't be afraid of contacting professors early in your college career um, to think about joining their research labs. And there are research opportunities, not just at these, you know, sort of like classic research schools like UCs. Um, there at Cal States have research programs, undergrad focused institutions have research programs. So yeah, I'd say getting research experience early would kind of be the, the your foot in the door. Okay, and then a second question. On like a day-to-day -day basis, what do you do in your research lab? Excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, your, your job evolves throughout your career. And so I won't go into like too many crazy details, but basically, you know, um, it, as an undergraduate student and shortly after undergraduate and even in grad school, I did a lot of lab work day to day. So generating data um, and then you move, you know, from once you've generated data, you move into analyzing data. So um, as a graduate student and postdoc, lots and lots of, you know, computational calculations um, and bioinformatics processing of data to you know really figure out what what are these DNA sequences what do they mean what is you know what are the results of our study um, so that's like pretty much all the way leading up to being a professor and then your job really changes a lot as as a professor um, and so I'll, I'll just be I'll be super brief um, about what that looks like I actually am not in the lab really much at all. I'm in the lab right now, like almost just as a show to be like, hey, here's a lab, look behind me. But I mostly am sitting in my office um, and I'm, I'm writing grant proposals. So I'm coming up with scientific ideas and kind of pitching them to uh, federal funding agencies, let's say like the USDA and the DOE to get money um, to support our research program. So all of the research that I've shown you today, um, you know, it's not funded by like my personal bank account, I'd be broke. Um, I, I, you know, come up with ideas that I pitch to these agencies that then come, you know, kind of fund us. So, so writing grant proposals, that's a big part of my job. Um, also mentoring students and postdocs who are the ones who are doing that research that I told you that I used to do. Um, so I kind of help them with, with troubleshooting and talking about the direction of their projects. Um, publications, that's a big thing. You've probably heard of peer reviewed journal articles. So writing those research papers, um, helping students and postdocs to write those research papers. Um, and then also of course teaching. So I'm not teaching right now, um, but that is part of my job very much as a professor is to teach at the undergraduate and graduate level in my area of expertise. So that's more or less in a nutshell what I do day to day. 